How is it going? How are you guys? Yeah? You good? Blessed. Blessed. Amen. All right. Uh, it's going to be Gary and myself tonight. Uh, I'm going to open. Uh, Nobody's leaving. That's good. They heard my name and nobody got up and left. No one left? Wow. I don't believe it. You almost did when it was just Daniel? Uh, let's open with a word of prayer, and, and then I just want to review us a little bit through the, the timeline of where we've been, um, and then Gary's going to jump into where we are tonight, okay? So you guys pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we love you. We're grateful for this evening, uh, our ability to study your word. Um, God, we, we don't do it for academic purposes. Uh, we, we want to have sharp minds and to think well. Um, so that we can know you. you. You have promised to meet us in your word and uh, for your spirit to help apply it to our lives as we think through the deep, deep implications of your word. You have revealed yourself to us through your word and we praise you for that, uh, for the magnificent uh, imagery and threads and uh, your dramatic fashion, your unfolding of your character and your nature, God, in such a compelling way. And so we love you for that. Uh, be with us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, so if you have your uh, uh, table of contents, you can see uh, our, our basic general flow. We spent the first two weeks and we just kind of laid the groundwork on uh, uh, the very beginning of the Bible so that we would have a foundation that everything else is, is going to flow out of. And then we spent... Um, the first week that we really did threads, uh, we did the thread of Adam. Okay, you guys remember this? Uh, we, we looked at Adam and then began to see the repeated patterns that took place from Noah uh, to Abraham to Israel um, and, and the use of language and the way that those patterns got repeated because then we pop up in the New Testament and we see the importance of Jesus being the second Adam, the last Adam, that all of that movement was going ultimately towards Jesus. That Adam typology becomes really foundational. Uh, a lot of these, as we go through them, you'll see lots of, of threads that, that cross over and they intertwine, okay? Then last week, what did Daniel cover? I wasn't here. You guys help me out. We covered the temple. temple. <laughs> the temple. And what did you learn about the temple? Oh, come on. It wasn't. Remember, you're being recorded. You're on video. Say nice things for other listeners. What did we learn about the temple? Well, that, that's the very end, right? The beginning was, right, that Eden was a, a temple, right? Because where God is, that is where the temple is, right? And then, and then the fall, and then there's the question, well, is, is God done striving with men? Is he done being close to man? But God provided a particular place where he began to show himself, right? And that was in the tabernacle, and then the tabernacle, and then the Shekinah glory moves to the temple, okay? Um, and then there's some complexity that goes on from the temple where, where the Shekinah glory leaves the temple and never returns. Um, and then Jesus shows up. And in John chapter two, what does he say? He says, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. Okay, right, and so we saw that Jesus was the temple. Um, he's the fulfillment of the temple, why? Because he is where the presence of God is. God in flesh, God came to be with us. He tabernacled amongst us, John 1, 14. The word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us, tabernacle, okay? And, and so we, we saw Jesus is the temple, but then, then where's the major movement after that? 
We become the temple, right? In Acts 2, the Spirit comes and indwells us, okay? We're gonna be doing a chart for this next time so that we can put some of all of this together, all right? And so now, this evening, we are ready to jump into the thread of a priest, a priest. So take it away, Gary. All right, so yeah, you go to a temple, and who's ministering at the temple? A priest. And we're gonna start with, begin with the end in mind, so I'm gonna look at Hebrews 3.1, that's in your notes, just stay up here, I'll read it to you. Keep your attention up here. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, partners in a heavenly calling, take note of Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess, who is faithful to the one who appointed him. So Jesus is a priest, and we're gonna see how the threads take us there. And big question asked is, what is, a, what is a priest? What is a priest biblically? Well, we're gonna go through a few things. There's much more that we could list here, but I'm just gonna go through a few. One, one thing a priest does is mediates the knowledge of God and his ways to all creation, to all nations, to all people. So the priest has that responsibility that people can come to know who God is. Second, he's an intercessor. The priest is an intercessor, so between God and God's people, the priest stands between delivering information that God wants him to know and also praying for individuals, so an intercessor. There's a big intercessor that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. Um, third, a mediator of God's covenant with his people. So God establishes a covenant with his people and the priest is responsible for them knowing the covenant, for being able to, to perform the covenant. So here's four things that relate to that, just four of them. One is teaching the law, so they understand what, is God, what are God's expectations to walk through this world, reflecting his image, walk through a world that's uh, sinful. So they wanna teach the law both through instruction and also through example. The priests are to be examples of the law examples of, what, of obedience to the law. Another is to administer, guard, and protect the sacred holiness of the temple. We heard a little bit about that last week when Daniel was walking through the temple. We heard about that with Adam. We'll hear that again. Another is ministering sacrifices. So all these cultic Levitical practices at the temple, including that which gives us atonement for our sin. So a priest does that. And then produces a priestly offspring because the priest is gonna live, but also his children are going to, going to, or intended, the sons to become part of the priesthood. And then the priest should be holy. The priest should maintain a personal holiness. And then finally, sustains the practice of Sabbath rest. We won't talk about that tonight because that's coming, but that's what a priest, that's what defines a priest. So there's two big threads of priesthood that we're gonna look at tonight. One is the priest and king, because some kings are also priests, and of course, Jesus is king, prophet, and priest. We're gonna look at three, three different um, individuals who you can classify this way. Adam, he was the prototype priest and, and king in the cosmic temple that Daniel described last week from scripture. Melchizedek, he just shows up for a moment, but he, but he comes really important in scripture. And then David, King David, he's the prototype priest king of the United Tribes of Israel. He functions in a priestly way and has declared that. So that's one thread, priest and king. A second thread is the priesthood of the covenant, the one that God established with Moses at the time of the Exodus, taking the people into the wilderness and setting them apart. So first, Moses, a primary intercessor. Second, Aaron called to be the high priest, and the Levite, the tribe of Levi, become priest. And third, Israel, the whole nation, is called to be a kingdom of priests. So that's one thread that we'll look at. And we're gonna weave these together because Jesus fulfills both what a priest king is and fulfills the priestly um, the, uh, the, the priestly ministers of the covenant through the new covenant that he establishes. And then also there's the priesthood of believers. 
just like that nation of Israel was called to be kingdom of priests, believers in Jesus, followers of Jesus, are to be a kingdom of priests. So we're gonna walk through this, starting with thread one. Yeah, so that, that's our overview, right? You got the roadmap. We're, now we're gonna walk through that and we're gonna define that, each one. And so our, our first one is how, uh, is the priest, the priest king role. Now, as we think about this, remember that Adam, okay, starts out in Eden, in the garden, okay? And re remember from Daniel's thread, Eden is where God is. It's God's presence. It's where man walked with God in the coolness of the day. And so we saw that thread from Eden, how, how it moves, but it moves and then it points to the final new heaven and new earth, which is the final temple, okay? God's presence there. So in the very beginning, uh, before there's any sin, Adam is placed right here in Eden. And before there's any sin, he is a priest and he is a king, okay? There's, there's no need for any other kings, okay? And those lines haven't been divided yet. And Adam is given uh, dominion and dynasty, and he's given authority to, to go out and to rule over, but also to protect, okay, and to care for that which God has put underneath his reign. It's, it's been said that one of the first faults of Adam and Eve is that Adam did not protect the garden. Why was the serpent there in the garden? Okay, ready to tempt and ready to disrupt. That, because the first command was to protect, to care and protect. So we're about to follow this thread because this king priest united role has its own special, unique thread through combined. We're, we're gonna break up in a second and, and define a priest differently. We'll get to that. But let's quickly run through, beginning with Adam, how this king priest is gonna weave through and ultimately point to us to King Jesus. All right. So let's go to, uh, um, we're sticking with Adam, going through, going through some of this or moving on? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, good. Um, so, prototypical priest. So, here's a few things to know about, about Adam. One, he's in the image of God, and we find him in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, in close fellowship with God. And he is to mediate the knowledge of God and his ways to all creation, because he's close to God, walking with God. Right? He's to rule over all creation. He's to be fruitful and multiply. So that's what God tells him up front. Uh, we're going to make. He's going to. He's going to rule. He's going to be fruitful, and multiply. So that means he's going to. He's going to produce an offspring. So long as he's holy, he's going to produce an offspring of priest kings mm -hmm. from his lineage. And he's going to care for and maintain. And Daniel talked about this last week. The cosmic temple. So the garden. And then from that, the whole, the whole earth, he's going he's gonna to care and maintain, and his offspring are going to do that. They're going to care for this cosmic temple and also guard, protect his, his, himself and his offspring in holiness by keeping evil out. In fact, he should not even, even allow Satan, that snake, to get in, right? And resist temptation to sin. So... That's his role as a priest, too, is, is to maintain holiness in the garden. But, sadly, problem, uh, Adam succumbed to temptation. He was tempted, and he sinned. And what did that mean? He corrupted the entire priesthood of his offspring to come. Um, himself and his offspring. So when we move into the... the priesthood past Adam, we're going to see that displayed over and over and over again. Next up, Melchizedek. Okay, so Melchizedek 
interesting fellow because he shows up real briefly um, and, um, and then he just kind of, it's a real short passage in Genesis 14. So, at, uh, so Abram, if you remember Abram, okay, so he's got Lot, his nephew. Lot went and took the land near Sodom and Gomorrah, so he's there. And kings swoop in. There's a war between some kings. They swoop in, and Lot gets kidnapped. Adam goes to, goes to war against them. He Abram. defeats them. And two kings shows up, and one of them is Melchizedek. So out of nowhere, here's Melchizedek. Um, and Melchizedek, Genesis 14 says, the king of Salem brought out bread and wine. Listen to this. Now, he was priest of the most high God. Okay, the priesthood that's going to come through Adam's lineage, through Levi, hasn't been established yet. But suddenly, here's this priest, and not just a priest, a priest of the most high God. He blessed Abram, saying, blessed be Abram by the most high God. He's close to God because he's delivering this blessing from God. Creator of heaven and earth, worthy of praise is the most high God who delivered your enemies into your hand. And then Abraham does this because he's collected all this plunder from defeating those kings. He gives Melchizedek a tenth. He sees Melchizedek as superior to himself. He sees them in a role of a high priest of God. And guess where Salem is? People believe that, uh, study, those who believe that that's Jerusalem. So fascinating. Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, that's what that, that's what that name means. The king of Salem, Salem is peace, He's a most holy high priest of God. No genealogy. So even though you're kind of scratching your heads and you're going, okay, so, I mean, it's just a short passage. Okay, that's good. Well, he's going to set a pattern, which is going to show up again and again. And we're going to see those shortly. But there's Melchizedek. Um, And there's a couple of passages that, that hint to what's coming because of Melchizedek, because of why he showed up. Um, There's a time when there's a corruptible Levitical priesthood. If you remember, Hannah goes to, uh, 1 Samuel, Hannah goes to the priest Eli. He's praying, she's praying for a son and then when Samuel's born, Eli's given, or Samuel's given to Eli. Well, Eli had two sons who were evil priests. They are taking the sacrifices that are supposed to be given to God. They're taking them for themselves and they're corrupt these two sons. And finally, God says, enough. And they go to battle. They take the ark with them. They get killed. Eli gets the news. And the news is, Eli, your priestly line is done. But there's hope. And this ties into Melchizedek. First Samuel 2.35, so as this judgment happens, uh, God says, then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest. He will do what is in my heart and soul. I will build for him a lasting dynasty, and he will serve my chosen one for all time, Hmm. like Melchizedek. Right? There's no beginning, no end. And then the time of King David. So fast forward to David's kingship much later, and and we're going to see David in just a second, but Psalm 110 talks about David... And his priestly role. And then Psalm 110 says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. He's not talking specifically about David, but he's talking about, because it says, the beginning says, The Lord says to my Lord, he's talking about that one is to come. And we'll get there. Third king, priesthood of King David. So we don't think of David as a priest. But he functioned in that way. Uh, he's not a Levite. You know, David's what? From what tribe? Judah. But he bears many marks of a priest. Um, so here's 2 Samuel 2 through uh, 2. David gets anointed. Well, Saul before him got anointed, but David is anointed as the king of first of Judah. And then second, when all the tribes come, he gets anointed again as the king of Israel. And anointing is something that 
through scripture, we only see that happening to priests. Okay, but there's more. He goes to bring the ark back to the holy city. The ark's not been there, but he's bringing it to the holy city. And while he's bringing it there, 2 Samuel 6 shows us he's wearing priestly clothing. He's got a, a linen ephod on. Well, that's what a priest was wearing during that day. He's bringing the ark to the covenant. Well, on the way, he's conducting sacrifices. So 2 Samuel 6 says he sacrificed an ox and a fatling calf. Well, that's what a priest would do. Um, he's leading worship because they dance and sing on the way taking this ark to where it's going to be. And he's stewarding the ark, which goes in where? The holy temple. So here's David doing all these things that show that he's functioning like a priest, even though he's a king. Psalm 16, 5, he says something about his inheritance that the Lord's given him, much like what happened to the Levitical priest. And then finally, he produced a priestly lineage. Second Samuel 8, describing uh, the people that are around him. And then finally, his sons in verse 18. And David's sons were priests. Which means they were doing things like priests would do. So this shows hope. Especially when you see Psalm 110. Hope both for the kingship and the renewal of the Levitical priesthood. Because it's corrupt at this time. And when, when in Psalm 110, David writes that and talks about a priest in the order of Melchizedek, a faithful priest who will be there forever, that's hope that a faithful priest king will come. But, and here's the bad news, because David stands out among all the kings. The next king's there's a slew of bad kings that come over and over and over, evil kings, kings that are, that are not following the, com the commandments of the law, not doing those things, worshiping other gods. Um, there's a division of the kingdom that happens right after Solomon. There's the rise of prophetic messengers, and so you don't hear very much about the priest at all following David, following his time. They don't show up. You see kings, some good kings, some bad kings. And then you see prophets coming in and telling the people uh, that they need to repent, telling the people that, that they're wicked, telling the people that God's going to judge them. And that sh throws shade on this hope that David wrote about and sung about in Psalm 110. Will there really ever be a priest in the order of Melchizedek, a priest forever? So, those three threads. And, All right, so uh, looking so bad. Th that's that's a, a first thread, and then we're, then we're gonna pause, we're gonna come back to it. Where do you think it goes after David? Jesus, it's always the Sunday school answer, right? That's where it's gonna go next. So we're gonna circle around, we're gonna show you how the New Testament specifically lays this out, okay? But now it's important for us to, to think through a, another thread of priestly line. And this is probably the one that you're most familiar with because we, we have to begin with the idea of understanding that this priest king sins, okay? And, and then after that, uh, because of that, sin has separated God from man. Okay, And God says he will no longer strive with man because of that sin. And he begins to uh, teach and instruct. And as he pulls out a special people for himself, as he pulls them out, he begins to, to need to describe to them his holy nature and character. And that is that that there is a sacred, secular, or a holy divide, okay? That's what this describes. There is a holy divide. And uh, that worship of God must be done in a particular sort of way, the only way that God can be approached 
because he is holy, because there is this new divide, right? And so we understand priesthood in this line. And the first one that we're going to look at is Moses. Now, Moses is going to lead us into what we're commonly thinking of in terms of the, the Levitical priesthood, and, and we're going to get into the tabernacle and do this, don't do this, and all the particulars and the sacrifices that priest, uh, that priest underwent. That's our next step. But it's important to understand that Moses begins as the, uh, as the mediator of a covenant. And what happens with Israel, Israel is in Egypt as a people, and God raises up a leader and, and brings them out. And there is this one figure who functions as really prophet, priest, and king. He's this spot where you see all of those, uh, of those positions converge into one figure. Guess what? He's Christ-like, okay? He's the mediator of this new covenant. And so we're going to look here at the way that he is this mediator of the covenant, how he's the high intercessor. And, and if, if we could say uh, what sort of roles he functioned in, he's this high intercessor of a priest. We're going to look at him first, and then we're going to look at the Levitical priesthood. All right. So Moses. Um, so, Jason said, function prophet, priest, king, uh, from burning bush to where God calls him, all the way through to the end of Deuteronomy, to the right before the people are going to go into the land following Joshua. Um, in his relationship with God, Moses is a type of a priesthood of Christ. Listen to this. For a large portion of the book of Exodus, if you read Exodus, you see God speaking directly to Moses and just to Moses. Uh, a form of the Lord spoke to Moses, a form, the Lord spoke to Moses, a form of that appears over 70 times in the book of Exodus. Time and time again, you see, Lord spoke to Moses, and God speaks to him, Lord spoke to Moses. Um, and when the covenant is given, so here's, let's go to Exodus 19, and so Mount Sinai, and there they are, and there's the thunder, and there's the people afraid, and Moses goes up, and Moses is alone on Mount Sinai as God communicates the covenant, gives the law, explains the way the priest, how the priest is going to be set up, and the details for the construction of the tabernacle, right? Moses alone gets all that, and Moses is the intercessor to teach all that to the people and, and get that work done. Exodus 32, so that's a break between, in the action between God giving the covenant and all the law. And Moses is going to go back with the tablets. And guess what? Aaron, who's going to be the high priest, the people convince Aaron to build this golden calf. Oh my gosh. Right in the middle of getting all this covenant law that they're about to receive, um, that happens. And God wants to destroy all of them and start again. And what does Moses do? in his intercessory role. He pleads with God and reasons with God, don't kill them. Don't destroy them. Um, and he also, because God's, I'm not going to go with them. No, you've got to go with us. So Moses, great intercessory role. And then in Exodus 39, 40, Moses sanctifies the Aaronic priesthood. So he gets that started he sanctifies him, and then he also oversees the construction of the tabernacle. And you see this repeated phrase, just as the Lord commanded. So he is ministering the covenant that God's established in setting up the priesthood and building the tabernacle and doing it exactly as God said to do. Post-Sinai, so let's go past uh, his time on the, on the mountain. Uh, Moses has exclusive access to God in the holy temple. So, uh, beautiful passage in Exodus 33. Um, Moses going in and out of the tent. People would see the glow on his face. And listen to this. Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent. 
and the Lord would speak to Moses. And the people were watching and seeing his pillar of cloud. And the Lord would speak to Moses face to face just as a person speaks to a friend. This exclusive role that Moses has that you don't see again in the entire scriptures until Christ. Will there be another one like Moses? Let's get to the end of the book of Deuteronomy. And here's what, uh, just as, as they're going to go into the land, Moses can't go. But the scripture says this, no prophet ever again in Israel like, uh, rose, arose in Israel like Moses, who knew the Lord face to face. So it leaves us with a question, will there be another Moses? Will there be somebody who's the intercessor who can set up the priesthood? who can lead the people into obedience to, to God, to follow him. So, will there be another Moses? All right, so we've seen the priest-king role, Adam to Melchizedek to David. Now, we just looked intensively how Moses, as the mediator of the new covenant, um, comes with the Mosaic Covenant, and Moses plays a specific particular role. But remember all that the Lord instructed for Moses to do, because God is holy, and he now must be worshiped in a particular way. God begins to unfold the only ways that you can approach him in worship. All right, and, and mainly, so through Moses, we're, we're told to create a sacred space. What was that sacred space? The tabernacle, okay? God must be worshiped in his sacred space. Now, we saw that, that that's going to move to the temple all right, now in addition to that, God is going to create a special people, right? So he doesn't just create the sacred space, he's going to call a people that are gonna operate in this sacred space, and what do we call those people? Priests, right? So this is the thread we're chasing, the priestly line. These priests are going to function in uh, in this sacred space. This is how we commonly think of a priest who functioned in this sacred space. We're, we're gonna see Levitical priesthood and we're gonna see the, uh, the Aaron line of high priesthood, okay? Those are the people that function in this space and then we're gonna see what they do in here, in this sacred space, right? They're, they're the ones who are gonna be in charge of the sacrifices, Okay, and, and they're the ones who are leading uh, the holiness charge to uh, what the, the term in theology is cultic practices that says do not taste and do not touch and wear this and wash your hands this way and do things a particular way. God says it must be done exactly this way, all, all those sorts of things. So this is gonna go through the priest. Uh, Moses has, has, this is how God must be worshiped and this is what the priestly line must do. And so... Ooh, how do you pick that line? How do you pick the people? How, do, oh, how, how did he pick the people? Yeah, yeah, this is really cool. How do you pick, how do you pick the, the people to be the priests? Well, uh, wh which priests? The, you know, the, the ones that are gonna be, the, the ones that are Moses is gonna, you know. All right, so coming, coming out of Egypt, right, uh, there, there, are, there are 12 tribes. But there's, there's one tribe that God chooses for himself. What, what was that tribe? The, the Levites, right? Now, there, there's an incredible theological thread. This is what I think you're teeing me up yeah, yeah. for. There's an incredible yeah. theological thread. Remember when, when Israel is in Egypt and, and Israel is, is called God's firstborn. And, and God specifically says, the firstborn from every womb is mine. It, it, and there's this thread where God's language is very potent. It's very specific. The firstborn from every womb is mine. So as they're entering into the land and he calls the Levites out for himself, 
In the beginning of Numbers, there's this incredible exchange that takes place where, where God says, listen, I'm no longer taking the firstborn. Instead, the Levites are going to be my firstborn. I am taking them as my possession. They are going to be my firstborn. And in, in the beginning of, of Numbers, there is this large census and mathematical calculation of the number of firstborns in Israel and the number of Levites. And God is so serious about this that he makes a mathematical calculation and then there is money that is exchanged for the difference. All right, you, you may be reading the, the numbers and think, what on earth are we doing here? Why are we counting the number of firstborns and priests and, and, and Levites and doing all this? Why? Because God is holy. And he says the firstborns are mine. He means it. And now he says I'm taking the Levites as my firstborn, as my possession. And I mean it. And he even calculates it out. He tells that so well. You know, he just, I just, yeah. So go ahead, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. So, so we're, we're walking through this, this space of, of there's been a sacred space that's been created. The priests are special people in this space who are in charge of sacrifices and what we call cultic practices. Yeah. And so he's gonna narrow down, so it's Levites, the entire tribe, right? They're going to be priests, but he's narrowing this down. He narrows it down to Aaron and his sons. So they're to be established as the high priests. Um, and Exodus 40 describes it this way. Here's God speaking to, to, to Moses. You're to bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent meeting and wash them with water. Then you are to clothe Aaron with the holy garments and anoint him and sanctify him so that he may minister as my priest. So he's over the priesthood. And he's over all the practices that are going to happen in the temple. And he's over the instruction of the, of the covenant and the laws. You are to bring his sons and clothe them with tunics. And anoint them just as you anointed their father. So they may minister as my priests. Their anointing will make them a priesthood that will continue throughout their generations. <gasps> Not so fast, because something's going to happen. They show up, and Leviticus tells us this, so they show up, and it's the first inaugural event in the temple of the priests doing their functions. They're going to they're do sacrifices for atonement, first the priests and then the people, and then offerings. And so that begins. Moses tells Aaron, approach the temple and do this. And then listen, verse 22 in Leviticus uh, 9 uh, then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people, blessed them, and descended from making the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offering. Moses and Aaron then entered the meeting tent. When they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. This is amazing, right? What an incredible thing that's happening. Then fire went out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat parts on the altar. All the people saw it. So they shouted loudly and fell with their faces to the ground. Oh man, this is good so far. That fire coming down, they see it, womp. Not so fast. This is disaster on day one. Next chapter, Leviticus 10. This has been going on, right? This, this celebration. Then Aaron's sons, the sons of the high priest, those in line to become the high priest, each took his fire pan and put fire in it and set incense on it and pre presented, presented strange fire before the Lord which he had not commanded them to do. So fire went out from the presence of the Lord, consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke. Among the ones close to me, I will show myself holy, and the presence of the people, I'll be honored. So Aaron kept silent. An immediate violation and God takes them out. Where do we see that New Testament where something like that happens? Ananias and Sapphira, mm -hmm. right? He takes them out because this practice is going to be holy every time it's done. 
All right, sounds like a good correction, right? (sighs) Well, things get bad. Once they get out of the wilderness, into the the promised land, faithfulness of the Levitical priesthood succumbed to the Israelites distancing himself from Yahweh and his covenant. And Israel's kings do that, and Israel's people do that. And they become evil over and over. They pursue other gods. They're rescued, and they do it again. And listen to the priesthood. Listen to how this affects the priesthood. The priesthood is progressively corrupted. From the time in the wilderness to the time coming back from exile, the priesthood is, is every time you, you read about them, almost every time, you see this corruption. So Judges 17, 18, um, Micah, who's kind of a ne'er-do-well, a priest comes, a Levitical priest comes to his doorstep, and he says, hey, guess what? I have these household idols. Come in and be my priest. A Levite, who's supposed to be a priest, becomes a priest to a, a, a worshiper of idols in his home. During the time of the judge and the king, so we saw, we read about 1 Samuel 2 with the sons of Eli. They were wicked. Um, the waywardness of Israel, as Israel continues to worship other gods, continues to ignore the covenant, continues to not follow the law, continues to build high places to worship others, pretends to worship God, but really not. And you see a disappearance of sorts of the covenant priesthood from Judges to Chronicles. So here's King David, who we talked about. 16 kings later, King Josiah. 16 kings later, 16 generations later of David in Judah. And here's Josiah. And his high priest, Hilkiah, they're trying to repair the temple. And someone finds a book and gives it to Hilkiah. Well, it's the book of the law. It's the book of the covenant. He finds the high priest doesn't have it. Think about that. Well, how, Josiah goes through all the, he reads it. He weeps and he institutes all these reforms. But the sad thing is, where were the priests? What was Hilkiah doing? Right? And then finally Malachi. Israel goes into captivity. They're, they're brought back after the 70 years setting up worship again. And then you see Malachi 1 and 2. And you'd think that the Israelites after that would behave. Malachi 1 and 2, God is telling the priests, you're not doing it well. The sacrifices, the attention you're giving to those who have and not to take care of, you're not doing it well. They're failing again. So you see throughout the whole Old Testament, this line that was built carefully by God just gets more corrupt and more corrupt and more corrupt and more corrupt. Adam, the high priest king, a lineage that falls, it fails. You get glimpses. Moses comes as a type of Christ, as the mediator of a new covenant. And as this covenant unfolds, there are these priests. There's high priests and regular priests. And all of them are supposed to usher you into the presence of proper worship of God. But as we've heard, testimony after testimony, they fail, they fail, they fail, they fail, they fail. And then fourthly, okay, that Israel, because Israel was a people that had this, they in and of themselves were supposed to be a priestly nation, okay? They were supposed to be uh, a, a people that is set apart because they are the ones who know how to worship God, the one true God, okay? Remember, I drew this back with Adam, this dominion and dynasty theme, that here's the idea, is that Israel, as a nation, was supposed to be a light on a hill. Why? Because they know the one true God. 
and the nations around were supposed to come to it. Why? Because they knew the one true God. They're supposed to be blessed because they have the God, the creator of heaven and earth, the blessing of knowing God. It was supposed to unfold in such a way. But as we've seen, okay, and, and, and again, the, the idea here is now you have a whole people in the scriptures that we're about to see are going to unfold. Oh, now all the people are supposed to be a particular way. Instead, what will we find? Instead of having the nations come to Israel, Israel just wants to be like the nations. That's all they want to do. They want to be just like the nations. Yeah. So we see Israel. Um, and imagine trying to be a trying to be a faithful priest during that whole time. Israel continually and progressively purged observance of the law. When we get to Josiah, and they didn't even know the law. Right? Profane the name of the Lord. When Jeremiah gives the prophecy of why they're going into captivity, he tells them, it's because you profane my name to the nations. And they pursued other gods constantly. Um, so you have by the, um, by the end of the Old Testament, and then you see it, of course, in the, in, the, in the Gospels. You see what's happened to the, uh, to the priest in the temple. He, Jesus' rant against the whitewashed tombs and all that. Is there any hope? Well, let's kind of weave the threads together, these two threads. So there's a prophecy of a coming faithful priest. We heard about that with Melchizedek. Um, and so despite the continual failings of God's chosen priest... And his people to be a kingdom of priests because they're supposed to follow the instruction of the covenant. They're supposed to have allegiance to God and God alone, the one true God. They're supposed to uh, regularly get atonement for their sins, either when it happens occasionally or once a year when they all come for atonement. But despite these failings, we still read the promises that a faithful priest of the new covenant in the order of Melchizedek will come. So let's go back to 1 Samuel, right into the book of Judges, or right in the book of 1 Samuel, post-Judges. Um, we're, we, and we read this earlier, so this is during the judgment of Eli's sons, and also a judgment of the trajectory of the, of the Levitical priesthood that God sees. He, he knows this is, this is coming. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest. He will do what's in my heart and soul. I will build for him a lasting dynasty and he will serve my chosen one for all time. That's right before the kingship start in Israel. And we go to King David. King David, Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies, that, that rule. And then verse four, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. A priest is coming. And then during the time of the prophets, so you'll see this in Isaiah, you'll see this in Jeremiah, you'll see this in Zedekiah, these promises of a coming priest. I love this one because it talks about what's going to come when, when the gospel is going to the Gentiles. So Isaiah 66, 18. So I'm coming to gather all the nations and ethnic groups, and they will come and witness my splendor. And then drop down a minute. They will tell the nations my splendor, and I will choose some of them as priests and Levites. He's not just talking about the Israelites. He's talking about all that he will bring in. Yeah, verse 21. Verse 21. I will choose some of them as priests and Levites. For just as the new heavens and the new earth, so looking ahead to the, the new heavens and new earth, I'm about to make will remain standing before me. So your descendants and your name will remain. So there's hope even beyond in the buildings of the new heavens and new earth. So your descendants and your name will remain. From one month to the next and from one Sabbath to the next, all people will come to worship me, says the Lord. So is there hope? 
Absolutely. God planted hope in the early time. God planted hope in David's time. Now God planted hope even when the prophets are railing against what Israel has done, what they've become. So, who's this priest? Weaving these two threads together, the priesthood of Jesus Christ, the order of Melchizedek, and the new covenant. So we're going to step through these four things, these four things that we looked at, talk about this. So Jesus Christ, uh, the incarnate Son of God, fulfills, fulfilled and fulfills the promised hope of the priest that we talked about. So let's start with the priesthood of Adam, right? Um, what does Jesus do in the cosmic temple? Well, he rules over it. He cares for it. He protects the cosmic and holy temple. We see in John chapter 1, right, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and we see that, that uh, message. And so Jesus is, is uh, bring dark, or bringing light into the darkness. We see in Colossians 1, 15 through 20, as Paul wrote about that, knowing that even the Jesus who walked the earth, truly God, was at every single moment caring for creation that he fashioned. And we see these promises of the new heavens and new, new earth in Revelation. So, fulfilling the Adamic priesthood, he's caring for even now, no matter what we see going on in the world, no matter the, trou the troubles and difficulties we see going on with creation itself, which is groaning while it awaits the return of Christ, um, Jesus is ruling over and caring for his creation. Um, and then the Mosaic priesthood. So we saw how uh, God spoke directly to Moses. God spoke to him as a friend would speak face to face. We saw that. Do you know the story of the transfiguration on the, uh, in, uh, in the Gospels? Here's Luke's. So this is, ama this is amazing. Um, so Jesus takes Peter, John, James up on the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed. Oh, wow. Who's that sound like? Up on the mountain? Yeah. Who's that sound like? Moses. And his clothes became very bright, a brilliant white. Who's that sound like? Moses. Then two men. Who? Who shows up? Moses. And Elijah began talking with him. They appeared in glorious splendor, spoke about his departure, all of these things. Peter and them are quite sleepy. Um, and then uh, 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 he's saying, hey, Peter says, hey, let's build some shelters for the three of you. And then what overshadowed, what overshadowed them? Cloud. Sounds like what happened in that tent of meeting, cloud over, over, overshadowed. But listen to this. Then a voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son, the chosen one. Listen to him. Not listen to Moses. Listen to him. He's a superior intercessor. He's a superior to Moses. It's a beautiful, uh, a beautiful passage when you think about that, about what happened with Moses. Now here's, here's Jesus. What yeah. Yeah, we see all those parallels, right? You think that's done intentionally? Yes, what, what do you think the scripture is trying to scream at you? <laughs> this, this, this. Like, hey, do you remember when Moses came and gave this covenant? And do you remember the way that Moses functioned as a special prophet, priest, and king? And, and how he went up on the mountain and how, he, and, and how the cloud descended and how he came down and his face was shining like the sun and, 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 and God would meet and talk to Moses and you were given a promise. There is coming one who is going to be like Moses that speaks with God face to face. And then Mount's transfiguration. And it's Jesus. And there's a cloud and they're up on the mountain and God speaks and Jesus by his own volition unveils his face and it shines and all of those parallels, why? And then God says, this is my son, listen to him. 
And if you're a good Bible reader, you go, my goodness, all of this has been pointing. They're, they're, that is the one who's like Moses that we're supposed to be looking for out of the end of Deuteronomy, isn't it? Well, there's coming one, and here he is. You see, all of those parallels, that's why this is called threads, because God mm. repeats and he shows you patterns. And if you're a good reader, it hits you uh, like in the face like, like a ton of bricks. And you're like, yes, how have I never seen this before? But yes, this is what God is doing because he's telling us the greater Moses is here. And now he is mediating a new covenant, right? Now we're going to go to the third one. And so... And my goodness, if this doesn't get you reading the book of Hebrews, shame on us. Uh, because um, Hebrews can be a tough book to read, but oh, there's so much in here about the, the priesthood of Jesus. When we look back and understand the Levitical priesthood, and then, that, and then that prophecy about the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus, remember, he's like David, but he's just like David. He's not a Levite. Jesus' genealogy is through, through, through David, right? So he's from the tribe of Judah. Good job. Right? He's the kingly line. Yeah. And, and, and that's interesting because he's going to introduce a new covenant. Jesus is the perfect, sinless, eternal priest prophesied. We saw that. Who inaugurated a new covenant and secured atonement through the heavenly temple by his own blood. He didn't have to, like the priest did, have to get atonement for himself. He was sinless. Do you guys remember on the day of atonement? How many times did the priest go into the Holy of Holies on the day of atonement? He went in twice. He could only go in once a year, but he went in twice. Do you know why? Why did he go in the first time? To offer sins for himself. Then he had to come in a second time to offer sins for the people. Well, there's going to be an important theological point that's coming here. Do you think Jesus is going to have to go in and offer sins for himself? I don't think nope. so. Yeah. And it's such a superior work of atonement he does in anything that happened at any moment in history in the temple. Um, before. So let's just walk through a few things we see in, in the book of Hebrews that talk about this, this aspect of his priesthood. So Hebrews 4.14, uh, and let's look at verse 15. For we do not have a high priest incapable of sympathizing with our weaknesses, but one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. He's a holy priest, perfectly holy, with sympathy for our sin. That's why he gave his life for us, yet without sin. As Jason described, he didn't need atonement, perfectly holy. That allows us to approach, because we know that about him, to approach his throne for grace and mercy when we need it. And then a perfect and permanent priesthood. Oh, this was teased so many times in the Old Testament. We saw some of those, right? Um, and listen, the others who, is Hebrews 7, the others who became priests were numerous. Remember that lineage that we talked about? Because death prevented them from continuing office. So we see that back in, in the end of Adam's age. We see that in, in Genesis 6, that lineage, and he died, and he died, and he died. And that was true of the priests. They died, they died, they died. But he holds Christ, his priesthood, permanently since he lives forever. That was what Melchizedek, that's what he was pointing to. Um, and what God talked about in Psalm 110 when David wrote that psalm. So he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So his atonement goes past in time, but we're, how many, how long are we since when, how, how many years are we since he was raised, since he ascended to be at the right hand of the Father? And his work of atonement continues. As you're praying for your three and, you're, and, and talking to the two and having dinner with the one, think about that. Jesus' Jesus's sacrifice continues because he's a priest forever. 
right? Okay. Third, priest of a new and better covenant. So this is Hebrews 7. And he walks through, walks through in this section of Hebrew, the writer walks through the, the, um, um, a little bit about the, the law. Um, and in verse 17 says, For this test, here's a testimony about him. You were a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. On the one hand, a former command is set aside because it's weak and useless. That's the Mosaic Covenant. For the law made nothing perfect. And Romans, Paul describes it just exposed sin. On the other hand, a better hope is introduced, the new covenant, through which we draw near to God. See? So the Mosaic Covenant replaced by the new covenant in Christ. One sacrifice, and with that, What's given to us that replaced our inability to obey the law? What was given in us? The Holy Spirit. He's going to talk about that in a minute, right? He's the priest of a perfect heavenly temple. It's the heavenly temple. So the main point of what we're saying is this. We have such high priests as Hebrews 8. One, one who sat down at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven... He ascended, his work is finished. A minister in the sanctuary and true tabernacle that the Lord, not man, set up. And of course, we go to Revelations and we see the temple that's going to come in the new heavens and new earth. Who is going to be the priest of that temple? The perfect and permanent atonement that, that giving his life for our sin so that we don't have to go back year after year after year he passed through the greater, more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, and entered once for all into the most holy place, not by the, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. So he, secured, he himself secured eternal redemption. And down at the bottom, it talks about how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our consciences, from dead works to do what? The thing that was intended by the priest to lead people to worship the living God. Wow. So I know we've thrown a, a lot of verses at you there, but I cannot help myself because there's too much good material here. You, you just need to hear it preached, right? In terms of look, look, at, look at the the king priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And look at the new Moses that came to offer the type. And, and, and look at how God created a sacred space and gave all the rules and particulars about how he must be worshipped and the sacrifice that must be made. And you must come in first for the blood of, of the priest and then you have to come in after that. And, and you weave all that, that the author of Hebrews continues to hammer right? And it sounds like this, okay? That, that we have a high priest who sympathizes, right? An intercessor. He, is, he, he was one of us. He was tempted in the way that we are. So he sympathizes with our weaknesses. This is a role of a priest. He understands. He's a go-between. You remember how, how Moses interceded for the people. And God said, I'm going to strike them all dead. And I'm going to start over with you, Moses. And Moses interceded. And he said, no, do not do it. That is our King Jesus who, who stands against the holiness of God and he intercedes and he sympathizes with our weaknesses. He understands. He is that sympathetic ear and he bids us to come. Yet he is without sin because he was absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect in each and every way. He was tried and tempted the same way you and I are, but he was absolutely perfect. And so he is the once and forever high priest that we all long for. Not the way the Levitical priest had to do it again and do it again and mess up and do it again and do it again. And, and even if they did it right, they had to, they had to offer a, a sacrifice every morning and every evening. They had to keep 
keep continual incense before the Lord, a soothing aroma. They, they had to, year after year, enter into the holy place once a year to offer the Day of Atonement. It had to be over and over and over again. Why? Because the blood of bulls and goats cannot wipe away the sins of man. In fact, God is the one who sanctioned all of this. God is the one who told Moses, this is what the heavenly temple looks like. You make the re replica. And God is the one who said it must be done this way, this way, this way. Why? Because he's always pointing from the very beginning that my son is coming and there is one king priest, there is one high priest, there is one who is going to come and do it all from beginning to end, finish. It's all done. And he doesn't come in with the blood of bulls and goats and he doesn't have to come in with sins for anything else. He comes in with his own blood. And he sprinkles, not the earthly sanctuary, but he sprinkles the heavenly sanctuary. And he comes and he cleanses the heavenly sanctuary against all sin. And he's the only one who is able to come before the throne of God in his perfect and in his righteousness. He comes before in his own name and he spills and he lays down his own blood. And then he sits down because he has sanctified once and for all forever. It is finished. They are sanctified, they are clean, they are justified. It is done all in the name of Jesus. Once and for all, perfected for all time. Amen. This is everything that unfolds and that the author of Hebrews does, right? It's all these threads converging. He's our priest king, according to the order of Malchizedek. He's our Moses, the one who intercedes. And he is the only one who did everything perfect. And he is unlike these people because he doesn't have to do it year after year. He does it all once for all for us. Sits down at the Father's right hand. It is finished. And he did one more thing, and it involves us. So remember how the priests were to lead the nation to become a holy priesthood? A holy nation, right? A nation of priests? Yeah, those who know God, Israel was supposed to be so distinct and unique mm -hmm. that they are a priesthood. So there, are, there is now a priesthood of believers that Jesus established. We're going to look at a, just a couple verses real quick. 1 Peter 2, 4, 5. So as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but chosen and precious in God's sight, and this to every believer, you yourselves as living stones, we talked about the temple last week, right? That we are the temple, are built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood and offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean in a practical sense? Well, Paul tells us in Romans, because he said, I'm one. Here's Romans 15, 15. But I've written more boldly to you on some points, so to remind you, because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. Listen, I serve the gospel of God like a priest so the Gentiles may become an acceptable offering sanctified by the Holy Spirit. God, or, or Paul saw his work, his work to take the gospel to the Gentiles as a way to draw people to God's holiness, do all the things that a priest does, mediate the knowledge of God, mediate the gospel to them, right? Help them re re receive atonement for their sins through Christ, what Christ Jesus did for them. Paul describes his work that way. And it's not just Paul. Priesthood of believers means every believer, right? First Peter uh, it, Peter continues, but you are, a, you are a chosen race. He's speaking to us, those in his day and to us. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own. So you may proclaim the virtues of the one who called you out of darkness into his mar mar marvelous light. And he goes on. And then finally we see in Revelations, ah, the lamb who can take the scroll, right? As things are going to unfold for the coming of the judgment day and the new heavens and new earth. And this is what they sing about the lamb. You are worthy to take the scroll and open seals because you were killed. Listen, and at the cost of your own blood, you have purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have appointed them as a kingdom of priests to serve our God. 
and they will reign on the earth. That's you and me. That's our church. We have the great high priest who fulfilled God's plan. And he has set us, you, me, this church, to be that holy priesthood. Um, so think about this. What does that look like here? What should you and I and the church be doing as members of a holy priesthood? Think about when we defined what a priest is at the beginning. Think of how you saw it as it was supposed to be done. Think about how we talked about Christ as a high priest. And then think about, we serve him. We want to see people coming to receive the atonement that was done by his blood in the holy temple and become living stones and join us as this temple's being built. Isn't that amazing to think about? Right? Yeah, amen. I mean, the theological implications are profound, right? That now through King Jesus, our ultimate high priest, we have become a kingdom of priests. And, and all those functions that we listed out at the very beginning, if you flip back to the very beginning, right? What is a priest? What does a priest do? And we see that through King Jesus, now you and I are able to function in that same way, that we have the access to come before our heavenly Father. This is the way the, the scripture begins to argue with you, right? Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. This is his permanent seat. He's sitting because he's finished, but he's also at the Father's right hand so that you and I can enter. And he bids us, come, come. You are mine, you are my dear one. I've covered you, I've redeemed you, come. Pray to me and ask and come before me. And, and beg on behalf of, of your dear ones and I will listen to you. Mm -hmm. the, the New Testament believer never hears I can't hear you. It's always, you are mine, come. And, and then the role that unfolds henceforth is magnificent. It ultimately returns all the way at the end to our return to the new heaven and new earth, which is the new Eden, and, and the, the priesthood continues forevermore. That's why the promises at the very end of the book of Revelation are are, uh, it uses such metaphorical language, but it says you will be a pillar inside the temple, right? Because, because if you were always on the outside, oh, what would it be like to be on the inside? Yeah, because we're priests now. Amen? The priesthood of the believer, the Holy Spirit indwells you. Mm. I mean, the implications here are profound, right? The Holy Spirit of God indwells you. Yeah, you, you come and we gather and it's powerful when we're together and, and there are some talking heads who are good at teaching that help us understand some things. But when you go home, you are a priest of King Jesus. You have access to the throne of God in your own prayer closet, in your own bedroom, when you drive in your car. You, who are you that you should usher into the throne room of God as you drive your car? You say, well, I'm, I'm a priest of King Jesus. I am his. That's it. There, there, there's nothing special about me besides King Jesus has made me that way. Right? And yet that's our access, friend. Beloved, it's magnificent. So let us pray to that end because the New Testament really wants to stir us up about the power and the importance of prayer and who you are now in King Jesus. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you we thank you that right now our prayers and our attention come all the way up to your throne and you hear us because of your son. Because of your son, because our hope, because our trust, because our faith.
is in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we pray that you would continue to teach us what it means to be your priest and to pray and to have the understanding and the power of prayer and to intercede for the people in our lives and to, to pray on their behalf and to realize that prayer does much work and to remember and to understand that the work is finished and that we are justified, completely justified, that that work is complete in you, King Jesus, and that we are always your, uh, yours, that you, you take ownership of us. God, there's so much that unfolds from this. Um, and as we see it, as, as we see the beauty, the beauty of your scripture in all of these categories and how they find their fulfillment in Christ, God, help us to walk out in them, in the beauty uh, and the magnificence of life that you call us to. We wanna walk worthy of you. Teach us so much more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.